2, 9 through 13. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and our hardship. We worked night and day in order not to burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so was God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, this is, I love this part. When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God of God who is indeed at work in you who believe. Man, is the word of God at work in you? Do you believe? Is the word of God at work in you? I love that. That, I love it. I love it. Do you guys get that? I love it when people respond to the gospel. They don't just hear it and just it just goes away. They go home and they go about everything that they've always done, but it actually changes who they are. It's, It's a beautiful thing. Last week, we focused on the importance of, of the whole church family. And I heard somebody say to me this week, well, I know you were talking about men. No, I wasn't. That was like two or three weeks ago that I was talking about men. Last week, I was talking about the whole church family. That's why we went to Titus. And I talked about all the things that we're supposed to do as the family of God and, and the, the things that we're supposed to do as far as lifting other people up and helping other people along. So as last week, we talked about the family the importance of the church family come alongside and being spiritual fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters. We had talked about the importance of living a holy life. That was last week. And I w- really wanted to get to the rest of these characteristics, but I didn't get to them, and I don't know whether I will today or not. We'll see. We'll see what God brings. But this week, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about the examples set forth in this scripture about living a blameless and righteous and encouraging and comforting and urging. That's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to throw in some life stories that I just experienced this week. And God's always at work in our lives. Did you know that? Like, pay attention. Just this week, somebody drove their car through my fence. It wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, they were only going like 10 miles an hour. But they they drove through the fence, caused all this damage. And I could have been like, well, those dadgum sons of guns and gone over there yelling and screaming, what's wrong with you? I could have done that. I know people that would have done that. But instead, I just went over and encouraged them. And then I helped them fix the fence. And while I helped them fix the tents, I told them about Jesus. They might come to my discipleship class. You never know. Use every opportunity you get to tell people about Jesus. So with that, we're going to talk about righteousness today. 1 Thessalonians 10, 10 and 12, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. So righteousness. Last week we talked about holiness. Holiness and righteousness kind of go together. They're a lot alike. I'll give you some, beha- some, some things that I got just off of the Google search. You guys can all do this too. You don't need me to tell you, but you didn't do it, so I'm going to tell you that righteousness is uprightness of character, a behavior, a response to the law of God. I was upright in my relationship with God when it comes to the law. So this is righteousness. Before man and God, upright. Before men and God, especially before God, when you're talking about righteousness, you're upright. Like you can stand firm knowing that I am doing what God has desired me to do. This is in view of Jesus. The moral conduct, it's an action, it's a verb. So it's, it's action. Like righteousness is something that, that we do, right? Do you guys get that? It's, it's a response of our heart, really is what it is from what God has done for us. It's a response of our spirit when God comes and lives in us and lives through us. Does that make sense? So Ephesians 4, 20 through 24, let me read that. It says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. What's he talking about? I had to do, I have to look it up because 
That, however, what's that? What's he talking about? That, however. What am I looking at? 20 through 24? Oh, that's why. I'm looking in chapter (laughs) 5. That's not going to work. Okay. Verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. So no longer live as the Gentiles do. No longer live as the unbelievers do. Actually, we're Gentiles. Did you guys know that? We're Gentiles. But in this context, he's talking to Jewish people, and he says, don't live any longer as the Gentiles do. And we could say it this way. Don't live any longer as the, as the non-Christians do, or the people that don't know Jesus, the people that haven't accepted Jesus and aren't saved. Don't live any longer as they do. In the fertility of their thinking, they are, they are darkened, and their understanding and, okay, I'm sorry, I'm butchering it. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God before, because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. So that's what he's talking about. And then, verse 20, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So righteousness and holiness is to be like God. That's what that scripture says to me. And it reminds us that we're no longer supposed to live the way we used to live, but we're supposed to live in a new way of holiness and righteousness. So I've got a story for you, another story that has, it's, it's connected to the story. Here's a lot happened yesterday. Yesterday I was cutting and chopping wood, and I, was, I had this goal. I had this big pile of firewood that needed to be cut with my chainsaw. It was a big pile. And I, my goal was, once and for all, to get that cut. Not chopped, but cut. And I was cutting away, and I was cutting away, and I was cutting away, and I was working, and then somebody drove through my fence, and I went and helped them fix my fence, and then I came back and was cutting away, cutting away, and then I'm going to go deer hunting, and there's a guy that I want to hunt on his land, so I was harvesting a whole bunch of grapes to give to him as a gift that maybe he'll let me. That, that helps. Like, you know, that's how we get people to come to the church sometimes too, right? But I was doing all this work, and I was working my rear end off, and all of a sudden, I was just wore out. I mean, I was wore out. And I went, and, I was, and I, my wife came home. My wife and daughter and, and uh, mother-in-law were, were, were at the house, and I came, and I sat down. But I couldn't sit down, actually, because I was too dirty. And I was like, well, should I just shower and be done for the day? But I haven't reached my goal. So I didn't shower. I went to the back deck, and I thought, well, I'll sit on the back deck where I can just have some water. And I went out there, and it was too stinking hot. Man, that back deck gets hammered with heat with the sun. So I thought, well, I'll go back in the house, and then I'm drinking water, and I picked up a chair, and I went and sat on my front porch. My front porch is nowhere near as pretty as the back porch. But I was tired, and I didn't care. So I sat down, and I started drinking water. And I drank, like, seven glasses of water and had half a sandwich. And then I went and had a glass of milk. And then all of a sudden... I felt refreshed. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I got energy again. Oh, I don't have to shower and give up for the day. I can actually go and keep working. So I go out, and I get my chainsaws back out, feel them back up, and I finished my project. And when I was done, I said, "Woo!" really loud. Because I was like, man, I, I, got to my, I got to the end line. And then I noticed that my neighbor was back with posts, and I went over and helped him finish building the fence. And I had all that energy, and I finally came in, and at the end of the day, I had told somebody about Jesus. And if I hadn't went and gotten refreshed, that wouldn't have happened. So with that, let me take you to John. And I'm sorry, um, Sandy, I'm out of my notes. God gave me new stuff today. So that's why I'm looking it up in my Bible. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 4. And I'm in verse 13 and 14. 
In John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, I'm getting somewhere with my story. Jesus answered everyone, who drinks this water will be, th- everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, talking about just regular water out of the well, right? But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. So Jesus brings a refreshing. Jesus can fill you up and refresh you and give you a new spirit and a new life. In, in Ezekiel, it talks about that Jesus is going to come and take your, your heart of stone away and give you a heart of flesh, something that's moldable, something that God can use. And then I'm going to jump over to John chapter 15. I've really been diving into John lately. It's a really good book. Mark used to be my favorite because it was action-packed. But man, I really like John now. That's kind of my, my new fave right now. John chapter 15, 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. So as we talk about righteousness, as we talk about holiness, and I talk about being tired, cutting wood, and needing some water, and I talk about Jesus saying that he is, he is the water that you drink and you'll never be thirsty again, he's going to refresh your soul, he's going to give you a new spirit, a new strength, a new, a new desire, a new direction, he's going to give you everything new, and you'll be able to go out and continue the work that God has given you. When we talk about righteousness, sometimes that is a hard work. To say no to myself. Dying to yourself, picking up your cross and following him is hard work. I don't care what anybody tells you, it's hard to do. It's hard to always say no to the flesh. But man, is it worth it. I, I got to the end of the day the other day and I said, woohoo, I finished the work. I got done. It's good. They're all really close to 16 inches long. They're perfect. They're ready to split. I mean, the work is done, hallelujah. And at the day, at the end of your day, every single day of your life, what do you do at the end of the day? Do you look back and say, I did a good work today at work today and I made a lot of money for somebody or for me? Well, that's good. I don't get as excited about that, to be honest. Is what I get excited about is at the end of the day I say, I made a difference in the kingdom of God and I lived a life this week that represents Jesus Christ and not me. That's what I get excited about. Do you guys get excited about that? If you don't, I'm going to encourage you. Think about that. Pray about that. To ask yourself, do I seek first the kingdom of God or do I seek first the kingdom of myself? Because that's where most of us are living. Now, most of us are living there, and it's hard work. You're going to get wore out. You're going to need to be refreshed by Jesus in order to keep up that good work, to be able to finish the day and finish your life full of his spirit and saying, and waiting to go up to heaven and have him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because that's where I want to be every single day. If I died today, would Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or would he say, I don't know if you're getting in, buddy. You know, I mean, really, that's a question that we have, to, we have to consider. Okay, Philippians 3, 8 and 10 says, What is more, I consider everything a loss. This is, how, this is why it's hard work. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Everything else, everything is a loss compared to serving Jesus Christ my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Guys, the law is not where we find righteousness. If you love Jesus Christ and he is in you and through you and you abide in his spirit, you will just automatically abide by the law. Like, it's going to be it's going to be a side effect. Just like if you go around all day long spending time with sinners, and looking at sinful things on TV, and looking at sinful things on, on or what, listening to things on the radio, or whatever, and you listen all day long to ugliness of the politics, guess what's going to come out of you? All that ugliness, but abide in Jesus Christ. So, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith 
in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I know, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. Man, you guys, Scripture is so full. It has so much life in it. Did you know that Jesus, or God, and I'll say God for this, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the Trinity, I'm going to say that. In the creation, when God created things into being and he spoke, it became something that wasn't there before. Like, how, how can I look at that and be like, I don't even know why I talked about that. God was doing something, but my feeble mind, I forgot. I have to write things down. I always write stuff down. But there was a reason I was going that, and I, trust me, it was good. <laughs> it was good. Because, here's how I know it was good, because it came from God. But um, the next step point is blameless. So we got holiness, we got righteousness, and now we're going to talk about blameless. It's a reputation before men. What's your reputation before men? Are they able to find fault in your life? Philippians 2.15, and let me, let me say this. Your reputation before men might mean absolutely nothing, but it also could represent who you are. We're really more interested in what God thinks of us, Right? And we're not going to take the judgment from other people if they think we did right or wrong or whatever. Sometimes one person might think you did wrong when you were definitely just doing what God wanted you to do. And you never know, so you have to be careful with that, that you don't start trying to allow people to judge and, and decide whether you're living a righteous life. That's between you and God. But blameless is a reputation before men and not able to find fault in you. So Philippians 2.15 says, So that you may become blameless and pure living a pure life. Children of God without fault in a, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky so that you may became, become blameless and pure. Guys, we are called to live a blameless and pure life. That's what we're called to. Somebody was just asking me yesterday what our church believes. And actually, the you know, the, the fence guy. And or is his wife, actually. What does our church believe? And I, I said, well, our church believes that Jesus Christ came and lived on this earth and died for me so that I can join him in heaven. And he died for my sins because I've sinned and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. And one day there will be a judgment. One day everyone will be judged. And one day... One day there will be, there'll be a decision of whether I'm going to go to heaven or hell. And Jesus came and died on the cross so that on that day, God can see Jesus and not my sins. So that's what we believe. And on top of that, we believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit that came when Jesus died, and the Holy Spirit came and filled me up, and I accepted Jesus and I was filled up, then he gave me the power to live a holy life. He gave me the power not to just be forgiven of sin, but not to sin anymore. And I think that when, when, we, when we have this idea that, well, Jesus came and, and died and, and for my sin, and now I get to live this, I get to live however I want to, and I'm going to go to heaven because when I die, God's going to see Jesus and not me, but I'm going to keep on going and doing what I've always done. Well, you're missing half of the Bible. Because the other half of the Bible tells us that you're supposed to that you're supposed to repent from sin, and that means that you turn from it. And it's what I keep learning in Scripture is that when you repent from sin, it isn't by your own power, and it's not by your own strength. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you if you abide in Christ. Are you with me? Yeah. I love it. I love Scripture. It, I, just, I just eat it up. Do you guys just eat it up? I mean, I just devour it. It's like... I can't wait in the morning. I was telling staff this morning, I remember when I said, well, I'm going to read one chapter a day. That was a long time ago. And man, I, if I just read one chapter a, a day, I think, I'd, I think I'd starve to death. I mean, I can't, I can't get enough of it. I, I, I read it for an hour every morning, and I read it through. Now I'm a pastor. I get to read it all the time. Every time I have a meeting, I get to read more. It's great. I love it. 
But the word is good. It's powerful. It will change your life if you begin to dwell in it and just, just absorb it. In verse 12 of Philippians, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you're blameless, if you're, if you're blameless, you're going to work out your own salvation. And when somebody or yourself notices something in you that's not holy, not righteous, and not blameless, you should go, are they right? Is that real? Do I need to change something? And then you need to work out your own salvation and, and, and overcome it. Every single day I'm searching out, what am I doing that, I, that needs to be better? What am I doing that I need to fall more and more in love with Jesus? What am I doing that doesn't represent the king? What part of my attitude, what part of my behavior, what part of anything I'm doing does not represent the king? Because I want to re- represent him. I don't want to represent me. I lived for a long time representing me. I enjoy living for him a lot more. And people are like, well, you know, I don't want to be a Christian because all you, is all you do is, is try to live by rules. B.S. I don't try to live by rules at all. I don't, is all I do is love him and let him live through me. And then rules, the things that God wants me to do, just automatically happen. That's just, it's just an outcome. It's just what happens from, from loving him. It's the outcome. It's him living in me, not me living, not me trying to tell him how I'm supposed to live. Titus 1.7 says, Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless not overbearing, not quick tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. I don't think there's any question, guys, in the Bible whether or not we're supposed to live a blameless life. Second or first Timothy three two says, Tell us tells me we must oh, okay, this is just me just paraphrasing. Tells me we must be above reproach. I must be above reproach. Like my life must be above reproach. That's blameless. That's to where somebody can't look at my life and say, well, I know he's a Christian, but mm. in fact, yesterday, you know what? You get to learn a lot about what people think when you talk to them about Jesus. That, cu- that couple I was talking to yesterday, talking to them about Jesus. And they said, well, we used to go to church, and you always hear this. But man, it's like, It it seems like a bunch of fakers. Like we would talk about how you're supposed to live and we'd read about how you're supposed to live and nobody was doing it. Well, I'm sure there's people in that church that were doing it. But there were some that were not. You guys, we need to be blameless. We need to be above reproach. Don't be the guy that people point to and go, well, I know he says he's a Christian, but he's definitely not above reproach. Be kingdom-minded. Now we're moving on to encouraging. Man, I want to talk about encouraging. That's so much easier than talking about being blameless. Encouragement. Do you guys like encouragement? Oh, I like encouragement. Man, encouragement is good. Did you guys notice when I sat down here and, and I encouraged those little girls? That's called encouragement. That's, I was encouraging them because I'm looking at them. I'm like, wow, they're leading this whole congregation to clap when other people like me, I don't have good enough timing, I can't clap or I'll just mess everybody up. So I have to wait till somebody like that claps so that I can join in. Just so you guys know, if you're ever waiting for me to clap, I'm not going to unless somebody shows me the timing. Sometimes if there's a drummer up here, I, I, I can watch, but I have to really try hard and then I can't really worship. Encouraging. In the French, the word encourage means to put the heart in. To put the heart in. So to encourage means you put the heart in. To discourage means what? That you tear the heart out. We are to put the heart back into people, not tear it out. So that's something for us to remember. Dads, moms, that's something for us to remember with our kids. That's something for us to remember as, as bosses, as, um, as friends, whatever. Whatever. Always be trying to encourage people. It's better to encourage than to tear the heart out. Because, man, there's always something you should... I went to counseling one time with my daughter and my wife, and we were trying to figure out how to, how to improve our relationships. And that counselor told me, you need to find something to 
to encourage your daughter with every single day. Encouragement is important. And it is important with my relationship with each and every one of you, and it's important with your relationships with each and every one of them and me. Encourage people. Put the heart in. Like, like pour yourself into people. Don't tear their heart out. Does that make sense? We need to encourage new believers to go on with the Lord. So encouragement comes down to also not just living life and encouraging people and petting them. I'm not all about, I'm not all about everyone gets a, gets a prize. I'm, I'm really not into that. I don't like that very much. I don't like that everybody gets a trophy, all that stuff, but I do believe that we can encourage people no matter what. I know you didn't get a trophy, but man, I know you tried hard. That's encouragement. They don't need to get a trophy for that. Somebody else was better. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear. This is an encouragement to new believers. So do not fear. This is encouragement for old believers. So do not fear. Guys, we don't need to fear. There's nothing in this world for us to fear. There is nothing in this world to fear. Isaiah 41.10, God says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Who is he? He's the one that I was talking about that spoke the world into existence, is with you, and he's telling you not to fear. Man, that's encouraging. I don't need to fear. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. It's not Mike Keller speaking, guys. That's God saying, do not fear. I will uphold you. I am with you. I will lift you up with my righteous right hand. God is saying, don't fear. Be encouraged. Be, don't be dismayed. I love you. If that doesn't encourage you, I don't know what will. If that doesn't encourage you, I'm going to say this, you probably don't know the God that I'm talking about. Because if he tells you, don't fear, I am with you, there is absolutely nothing to fear. If you go into the Old Testament, you watch every time the Israelites would put their hope and their focus on God, and he would say, go, they would go and defeat enemies like there's no tomorrow. I mean, sometimes they didn't even have to show up. God went before them and messed the armies all up. And these were armies bigger and badder than they were. God says, don't fear, I am with you. If God's telling you, don't fear, I'm with you. You guys, if God's telling you, don't fear, I am with you, he's with you. He's with you. And I'm going to, I just let the spirit work sometimes. I didn't tell everybody today, but I'm going to now. Is that okay? Okay, the board knows and the staff knows, but the Hansons have been called to go to a church. And they're going to go to Coquille. Uh, they're gonna, their last week is going to be the 30th of this month. And this is pretty new. I mean, we've known that it was potentially going to happen for a while, but I'm super excited for you guys. And while you're doing that and you're considering that and you're struggling with this call and, and the difficulty of, of moving, the difficulty of losing jobs, the difficulty of all of it, the financial unknowns, all of it, do not fear. Because he who called you is with you. And if he is for you, who can be against you? Nobody. So let me say this. I just announced something pretty big. Somebody has been called into ministry and they're giving up their life to go serve in a community in the church of God for the kingdom of God. So let's have a hand for that. <laughs> we'll have a sending away um, on the, uh, what is that, the 23rd. Because the thirtieth, I'm going to be gone. So on the twenty third, we're going to we're going to have him up here. And we're going to pray for him and and bless him and, and anoint him with oil and all that stuff. And I've got some ideas of, of what that might look like, but I haven't decided for sure. Might be a big deal. If God's in it, it'll be a big deal. John sixteen thirty three says, Jesus says, you will have trouble in this life, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. We don't need to be afraid of anything. We can be encouraged knowing that Jesus has overcome.
overcome the world. The enemy is already defeated. We already have every tool we need to keep him at bay. We just need to do it. Ephesians 6.4 says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It doesn't say, Fathers, don't do anything to your kids that you let them get away with murder. It doesn't say that. It says, don't exasperate them. It says, don't just make it hard on them just for the fun of it. It says, it says but train them up in righteousness. Training up in the instruction of the Lord is what it says specifically. This is an encouragement to get back in the saddle and try again. Okay? So have you ever, this is my point, have you ever um, done something and it didn't work the first time you gave up? Have you ever tried to disciple somebody and it didn't work very good and you never did it again? Think about what it is. I'm not going to keep on naming things off. You think about what is it that I've done that I gave up on because it didn't work the first time. And I'm going to say, get back in the saddle again. Can I have a picture of me on the mule? You see that mule right there, the one that I'm riding? I, you guys get that vision in your eyes for just a minute. I'm riding it. I'm riding that mule. I've had that mule for like six years. For five of those years, I never rode it. When I bought her, they said, well, she's a good pack mule, but, you know, we got her, and she bucked my husband off twice, so we don't ride her. I said, okay. So I bought her to pack, and she did a great job packing my gear and stuff when we go hunting and things like that. And then one time I put a saddle on her, and she acted really goofy, and then I put my foot in the saddle, and, man, she started bucking. And I was like, whew. I'm not doing that. And I watched her run out in the pasture, bucking all over, leaping in the air like a wild bronc, like you watched down at the rodeo grounds. I was like, no thanks. <laughs> and I never tried again for, for six years. I'm guessing on years. And then all of a sudden I was like, I really, man, that, she's so gentle. She's so nice. I, I pack gear on her. She never blows up. She never acts goofy. I just think I got to be able to ride her. And then, I threw a saddle on her, climbed on, and rode around. I have no idea. It's a miracle. I have no idea. But for six years, I could have been riding that mule. But I didn't. What is it that God's been calling you to for six years or for your entire life that you haven't done because you're afraid? See, I was afraid to get on that mule. I was frightened to death. I was like, I'm not getting on her, man. I I like my neck too much. I got kind of a long neck, have you noticed? And I don't want to break it. So I didn't get on. But once I did, man, there's no going back. Man, we're doing good, you guys. I might even finish today. Similar to encouraging is comforting. But the emphasis is is an activity. So encouraging was was telling people, and, and it can be doing things too, but it's, it's encouraging people verbally is what I'm thinking. Like, like, good job, keep doing it, man. You can do it. I know you can. Encouragement. Encouragement, encouraging people to do better, to, to live after God. But similar to encouraging, but with the emphasis on activity is comforting. Hugging, providing comfort, hot chicken soup. We can't just coddle, but we must also encourage to keep going. So we have to encourage, and we get to cuddle too, right? To me, that's what the comforting is. That's the, I'm a, uh, my love language is physical touch. I love to cuddle. I, I like hugging. It's, it's my thing. It is. It is. <laughs> my, my wife isn't. John chapter 19, again, John, I, that wasn't on purpose, by the way. Chapter 20, or 19, verse 25 through 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. I'm just going to read it up there. His, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of, I didn't practice. Uh, Pastor Todd, or Pastor uh, uh, Scott Delbridge told me one time that if you just say it like you, like you think, you, then people won't know. But <laughs> Mary, the wife of Clopas, and then Mary Magdalene, 
When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciples took her into his home. I think about that, I think of comforting. I want you to picture what's going on there. This is Jesus on the cross. He's hanging up there. He's dying. He's taking his last breaths. And he, and he looks down and he sees his mom. And he sees his good friend John. His disciple John who loves him. It says that. He says it about himself. It's kind of weird. But, he's, but anyway, he says this. And he's up there and he says, he says, Mom, woman, Mary, this is your son now. And John, this is your mom. Take care of her. He's comforting his mom even when he's on the cross. Guys, are you going through it? You still have something to do and comfort other people. We still get to comfort other people. Even if I'm going through it, that doesn't mean I have to treat other people badly. It doesn't mean I have to just forget about everybody else's needs. When I'm going through it, I'm still called, just like Jesus was, to comfort and encourage other people. Are you going through it? Pick up your cross and start comforting people. And I bet you that God will help you get out of what you're in right now if you start looking to other people and looking to him instead of into yourself. Does that make sense? Man, God can make a, a difference in your life instantly. Urging, exhorting to move, some in specific course, in, to move somebody into a specific course of conduct. Urging. Cattle prod, you ever think about a cattle prod? About a whip? I'm urging you. I'm going to urge you. Can I share uh, Thursday night, Todd? Okay. Thursday night, Todd calls me. I, 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 he says, or I don't know if he, I think it was a text. He goes to a discipleship group at my house. And he says, I don't know if we're going to make it tonight. I get it. They're working long days, and they're barely getting to my house. They, they're work construction all dirty, been working hard all day. And, and he says, I don't know if we're going to make it tonight. And I said, hey, if you, if you aren't coming because you haven't done your homework, I want you to come anyway. And he's like, Arr! <laughs> he won't let me get away with it because I'm going to urge him to keep keeping on. I'm going to urge him to say, don't give up. I know it's hard. I know it's hard work. But sometimes we have to die to ourselves. Sometimes even when it's hard, we have to die. And then you know what I do sometimes too is when they get there, I go, you know what? I know they're tired. I know that they came straight from work. Are you guys hungry? Can I get you some food? Because now I'm encouraging them. Now I'm comforting them. I urge them and I comfort them and I encourage them. I do all of those things. We do all of those things. We should do all those things because he did it for us. He did it first, actually. And he's just calling us to be like him. I love that God works in our life in a way that I can come up here and talk about scriptures and I never even dreamed about sharing some of these stories. But God just fills us with so many opportunities if we recognize him in it. If we just recognize that God's in it. Now I want to urge you I'm going to say men at this moment. This whole lesson's for everybody. But I'm going to urge you men of Monaz. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Wait a minute, you can take this too. That's fine. Watch and keep awake. Stand true in the Lord. Keep on acting like men and be strong. Christians, keep on acting like Christ and be strong. Men, act like men. Lead by example. Lead by love. Don't sit on your hands. Don't wait for your wife to do it. Don't wait for your kids just to grow up and get out of the house. You don't have to worry about them anymore. Act like men that God has called you to act like. Ladies, you do the same thing. Act like the lady that God has called you to be. Read Proverbs 31. You'll know what the woman's supposed to look like. It's pretty intense. Joshua 1, uh, 6 and Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 7 says, Be strong and courageous. 
Worship team, I'm going to close now if you guys want to come up. Paul brings a gentle love to the Thessalonian church. I love Paul. I know a lot of people don't like Paul. They're like, well, the Paul's, you know, whatever, but the Gospels are it. And, and I, the Gospels are it. But I think Paul's it, too. I think that guy is, is dynamite. I like him. I like him a lot. I love his teaching. I think he's an example of everything. But Paul brings a gentle love to the Thessalonian church. Sometimes a nursing mother and other times a father who brings strength, character, and encouragement, discipline, and teaching. We are a family of believers. We are a family of believers who are called to stand in the gap for one another. Will you stand in the gap for me? I'm going to stand in the gap for you. I really am. I am because I love you. Will you stand in the gap for me? Will you stand in the gap for one another? Will you make it your life mission to, to, to be a family in the family of God that actually loves each other? And you don't look across the room and go, well, I'm mad at that guy. I don't like him. If you don't like that guy and you don't like him, go, go talk to him. You know, I mean, let's love each other. Every one of us. If we don't communicate, then we can't love right?